Charleston on Sunday, June 29th. All roads lead to WWE's Money in the Bank pay-per-view. Live in Boston for the first time ever. See John Cena, Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, Sheamus, The Shield, The Wyatt Family, and more. Compete to seize the briefcase with a Money in the Bank contract for the chance to become WWE World Heavyweight Champion. It's WWE Money in the Bank. Live in Boston, Sunday, June 29th. Tickets available Saturday, April 12th. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Harley Race. This is Mick Foley. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. This is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, it is Tuesday, April the 22nd, 2014. Welcome to another edition of the Wrestling Insiders. I'm Dan Marotti here in studio, joined by the man in Studio B, the one, the only, Mr. John Cena Sr. You what there, Johnny? An honor. What an honor and a privilege it is for me to be able to come into your homes and your living rooms. It's fabulous. Well, fans, if you're unfamiliar with the happenings in the MWF, Mr. Cena and I are not the best of friends, so we're in different studios to discuss the latest happenings in the world of professional wrestling. The king of sports. Obviously, it's April, Johnny. Everyone's talking about it, but we can get some perspective, some insight from a man that was actually there, Johnny. Let's talk WrestleMania weekend. You were one of the lucky ones that made their way to New Orleans. I was in New Orleans. I was fortunate enough to be able to speak to a lot of the individuals involved in WrestleMania. I actually was able to speak with, if you can believe this, my hero, the man that I admire most in professional wrestling. I had the chance to actually chat with the one and only Bruno San Martino. Unbelievable human being. Scott Hall, Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, Steve Austin, Mick Foley, Road Dog, Rikishi, they were all there. It was just a wonderful experience. It truly is the greatest show on earth. And WrestleMania that night, I'll tell you the surprise of the night was not Daniel Bryan getting the belt. I think everybody kind of expected that. I think it was when the referee went <laughs> and the dead man failed to rise. The end of the Undertaker streak. I tell you right now, folks, you can hear a pin drop in that arena of 85,000, 90,000 people. Shock, shock. Divas match outstanding. The best Divas match that I've seen to date. Great matches, great matches all the way. Bray Wyatt, John Cena, The Undertaker, Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman, outstanding. Paul Heyman, the biggest and best villain of professional wrestling today. Daniel Bryan got his just reward became the new WWE Heavyweight Champion. Well, it was certainly the showcase of the Immortals, as they call it. It's hard to believe it's WrestleMania 30 already. Um, it'll celebrate its true 30th anniversary next year because the first one was March 31st, 1985. But Johnny, you're a fan of tag team wrestling. One of the standout matches to me during WrestleMania happened to be the four-way tag team match. And I thought it was so exceptional because it wasn't your typical four-way match of the first team that gets a pin wins. They did an elimination style, which is how those three ways and four ways came to be. Um, the Usos retained the gold over um, the Real Americans, Rybaxel, and the Matadors. But as a, someone that enjoys tag team wrestling, I'm interested in your take on that matchup. I think that that match was well put together. I think that they did an outstanding job in what they did. Um, I... I would have preferred to see it handled a different way rather than elimination style or the way they did it. Um, but again, it's just me. I still think that that was a good tag match. It held your attention. It kind of kept you guessing right to the very end because I'll tell you what, I was right there at ringside and I, as an onlooker, thought the Usos were going to lose their titles. Well, in a lot of circumstances, when you have the three ways, four ways, sometimes even more than that now, it certainly puts the champion at a disadvantage, but Usos retained. 
Um, you finally saw the breakup of the Real Americans, Jack Swagger and Cesaro. Cesaro is really getting hot coming out of WrestleMania now that he's been put with Paul Heyman. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But Jack Swagger is someone, Johnny. I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I certainly think um, it almost seems like he hasn't found his footing as far as being a big guy. I think he's got a personality down pat, but as far as being a big guy, because Jack Swagger is... I don't think people realize just how big he is when you see him on TV and WWE, because there's a lot of big guys on WWE television. It really doesn't stand out. But he's, I could see him really, um, when the right opportunity comes at the right time and that door opens up for him to take advantage of that opportunity. And I think he could be a main eventer, not someone that kind of flip-flops down to the intercontinental U.S. championship ranks. I really think there could be a lot uh, in the future for Jack Swagger. I, I don't know what you think about that. Jack Swagger is an outstanding performer. Jack is, and I'll say this, having met him several times, eaten with him, he is huge. You know, there's always the gimmick out there. There's always the chance. Maybe this time Kane's got another brother. So you never know what can happen with Jack Swagger, but I do agree with you, and that's unfortunate that I have to agree. Yes. I think that there is a place for Jack Swagger, and I don't think it's with Zeb Coulter. I think that Jack can hold his own. I think now that they've split up Cesaro and Swagger, and now Coulter will be calling out, uh, hopefully, Paul Heyman. And the big question is now, will Cesaro be a face or a heel? Well, Paul Heyman is basically a heel type of guy. Cesaro is over. Let's see what happens. As far as Swagger goes, I say disassociate, get out there, create a character. The one thing about Jack Swagger that I see that's wrong, he doesn't have a character. Well, we'll see what happens with that. I am a big Zeb Coulter fan. Um, you talk about Paul Heyman moments ago, what an evil individual he is nowadays on WWE television. It's almost like a rejuvenation of managers. As someone that is a manager, as someone that is a benefactor of several wrestlers throughout the United States now that you travel so often, what do you think about, or what is your opinion on Heyman and Coulter maybe opening up the door for more individuals to be mouthpieces? I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think that that WWE, TNA, any other wrestling promotion does a disservice by not having managers. Paul Heyman, one of the best in the business, and I salute you, Mr. Heyman, for being the best in the business. And Zeb Coulter, you know, ever hear of a man called Dirty Dutch Mantel? Well, Zeb Coulter, you remind me an awful lot of him, <laughs> whether that's just a reminder or whatever, but two individuals that have proven that with that outside help, you can get that added heat. And I said it before, and I'll say it again. Being a manager of champions myself, I can tell you that when you can have a person that can wrestle and can't speak and needs brains, that's when the manager comes into play. If and when they bring the managers back, if and when they go back to the way it used to be, and that might just happen in some cases, I think wrestling with the manager and the wrestlers become much more interesting. You think about it, my gosh. I, started, I became a fan in uh, 1986, so I would have been five-ish, but whatever. You had Bobby the Brain Heenan. You had, as much as I don't like him now, because he's a thief, the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. You had Slick. You had Mr. Fuji. You could even consider Miss Elizabeth to be a manager. You had luscious Johnny Valiant. Captain Lou was just winding down his career in 86. Uh, classy Freddie Blassie was just winding down his career in 1986. You'd have at times... You know, the battle of the managers to sign Macho Man. You had the battle of the managers to sign Bam Bam Bigelow, and then Sir Oliver Humperdinck came in. He's one of the great managers that really doesn't get his kudos at times because he wasn't that big of a star in WWE for a long period of time. But I'd love to see a renaissance of these great managers that add so much more to the great athletes that are competing inside the ring. You need that. You need that extra touch because you could take a guy or a professional wrestler, male or female, and I still stand on what I said about female wrestlers, underutilized. A lot of these young women are superstars. And I think, as my interview with, with, with Lonnie Kai went, some of these young ladies could probably kick some of the asses of some of these so-called superstar wrestlers in the ring. So manage a female, manage a male. It becomes an integral part of what we need to see in this business, because remember, this is Star Wars, good versus evil. Nobody more evil than me. So, you know, it's important that we reach out, that we get these superstars who can wrestle but can't quite use the stick, 
and you got this outside interference, the jaw jack and his Paul Heyman proves day after day, event after event, the most eloquent speaking individual in my book that anybody has seen as a manager. Been there, done that. Managers, we need you. Come on back. We got to have it. We got to have it, Variety. That's all I'm going to say. We'll skip around a little bit. Um, the night after WrestleMania, my God, Paul Heyman cut, I would consider it a legendary promo in the squared circle, discussing the Brock Lesnar Undertaker match. I, the 21 and 1 quote, I think, is going to be used a lot, and it's created nuclear heat on television. I don't even know how it came across in person. You were there in Raw in the front row live, Johnny. What was it like uh, to be there for that Paul Heyman? promo with Brock Lesnar about defeating The Undertaker, and what was the atmosphere like at the live arena? Well, the atmosphere at the live arena when Paul Heyman took the ring, as you know, all he's got to do is, like Vicky Guerrero, another perfect heel, just come through the curtain, begin to walk down the ramp, and the boos begin to, to show. And that's another good sign of a good manager. Paul Heyman, Vicky Guerrero doesn't have to say two words. It's automatically a boo. Heyman reaches the ring with Brock Lesnar, begins his soliloquy, if you will have it, um, talks about, and one of the things I was impressed with was he said, let's do a little bit of a shoot here, and let's talk about how Undertaker was taken to the hospital, how Vince McMahon left WrestleMania 30 in an ambulance along with The Undertaker. Um, I think Heyman really did a great job of putting over the dead man and putting over who I believe will be the next world heavyweight champion. He will defeat Daniel Bryan. Leg out for the monster, Brock Lesnar. There's your next heavyweight champion. But all in all, Dan, I will say this to you. I think Heyman got 100 plus in my book for what I consider to be one of the best promos of the night. Well, I'm going to throw this at you. A lot of longtime fans right now, um, a lot of the wrestling pundits, uh, claiming that Paul Heyman is the greatest manager of all time. Now, I have always held Bobby the Brain Heenan in that category, nothing against my dear friend Paul Bear, but I always thought Bobby Heenan was the best manager of all time. Who do you think, as a, a fan long before I was, who do you consider to be the best of the best? <laughs> Other than yourself, yeah. Me, of course. Yeah, okay. John well, Cena after Cena, you. Johnny after you. Fabulous. After you. I am the manager of champions. Uh, I'll tell you what, I've worked with, um, God rest his soul, I had a chance to work with Captain Lou. I watched, I worked with um, Freddie Blassie. I had a chance to watch these individuals coming up the ladder. I think Paul Heyman adds something that the rest of them didn't. Heyman adds a little bit of, what's the word I want to use here? Um, uh, when he speaks, you want to listen, even though you may not really want to hear what he has to say. Unlike the other managers um, who just kind of came out, you know, typically my man's going to do this, we're going to do this, and if you stay with me, I manage champions. If you want to be a champion, stay with me. I think Paul Heyman's kind of turned it into a business rather than strictly manager. When he says, I represent my client, it's almost like there's a contractual dollar amount that goes with it with a guarantee. Um, the greatest manager in my book um, I would probably have to go with Paul Bear. I think he. You think Paul Bear is the greatest manager of all time? Well, I'm not. I, take I a look at who he managed. It, but, okay. Take a look at what he did. He took this young man, this Undertaker, and 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 created a character. Meaning, Paul Bear, the funeral director, or what she really was in real life, Bill Moody. Um, and he, he, he captured the audience with this eerie, mystical mist and mystique. It's okay to go out there and do what Heyman does, and Lou Albano used to yell and scream, and Freddie Blassie used to file his teeth and shake his cane, and Jimmy the Mouth of the South had his megaphone. You know, Bobby the Brain Heenan undoubtedly was one of the best also. But I think when it comes to, in my book, bringing it all together, and creating a total managerial concept, the mystique, the villain, the highs, the lows, making you truly believe, I think uh, Bill Moody, Paul Bear, God rest his soul, I think did the best job of anyone. Well, I mean, certainly one of the most memorable managers of all time for what he did for so long, and that lives on in video. 
But I'll tell you this, Paul Bear always considered Bobby the Brain to be the best manager of all time. Back when he was Percy Pringle, he did the blonde hair job, and he wore the sequin jackets, jackets and so on. Um, that was kind of a tip of the hat to Paul Bear. I mean, to Bobby Heenan from Paul Bear. Uh, but, I mean, everybody has their own opinion. I'm a I, Bobby the Brain guy. You're a Paul Bear guy. I wouldn't argue with you, Dan. I mean, and that's unusual. Yes, it um, sure is. But I guess we could, you know what? I think you and I could say, of all the managers that we have seen in professional wrestling, who would we consider to be the top? I would say Paul Bearer and Bobby the Brain Heenan. There's no question that those two in my mind, and I've been at this a long time, stand out the most, the most in my, in my mind as, as managers. Well, let's talk about Paul Bear, a man that did a lot here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation for so long. I don't think the athletes here in the MWF realized how much Paul Bear did. Um, I met him for the first time back in 1994 in the locker room at the old Boston Garden in the Hilton Hotel where they stayed back then. I mean, a genuine person then. He came to the MWF for the first time in 2003, turned into a great friend. Um, even though he had gone back to WWE, we had still communicated about certain things. And you know, his eye was on everything. When he came back to manage Dylan Cage in the trifecta of terror before he had his other resurgence in WWE, and was gone. Still, he was someone that I was on the horn with, or email and so on, texting, you know, if not daily, just a few times a week. So the athletes in the MWF really benefited from having him around. Um, and I think it hurts that he's not here with us now as much as we'd like him here for friendship, but even his wisdom when it comes to wrestling, because he was on it. But it was a touchy subject with me was the Hall of Fame. Um, we have our friends in WWE. I don't like to say anything bad about WWE unless it's something that I feel passionately about. But, and I remember this was at the last Cauliflower Alley Club reunion in Las Vegas. For fans that don't know what that is, it's a nonprofit organization that consists of mostly wrestlers, some boxers, and some stuntmen. And Paul Bear said that he wanted to be inducted, not with, but the same year as The Undertaker. And I, when he passed, I don't know, when the Hall of Fame talk came around, I really wanted it not to be true that he was going to be put in this year because Undertaker obviously wasn't going to go in this year. Um, but I'd have to say this. I was angry about it. I was hoping that his wishes um, would be honored. But WWE saw it fit to have it done this year. I mean, it's their Hall of Fame. It's an honor nonetheless. It was easier for his two sons and other family members to be able to go from Mobile, Alabama to New Orleans. But I have to say, I could not get over how outstanding of a presentation that was. First with Kane, who um, Percy, as I called him, always said was the easiest to work with. You know, doing the induction speech, his two kids, who we live for, came out. Um, they gave a quick speech. And then the first, and I'm sure the last time we'll ever see anything like that, Undertaker came out with the urn to salute a big picture of him. Johnny, you were in the fourth row at the Hall of Fame. Your thoughts on seeing, uh, I guess he was your friend in some ways too, even though you had, uh, you were enemies at times here in the MWF, but your thoughts on Paul Bear's induction into the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2014? I think it was handled very, very well. I don't think it would have been well to induct both he and The Undertaker at the same time. I think that you would have taken away from Percival Pringle, Paul Bearer, William Moody. The class in which this induction was handled, and I said this to Kane in the back after the Hall of Fame, and the way it was handled was impeccable. It was an honor and a tribute to a great human being. The way that, that, that uh, Ken, uh, Kane came out and spoke, the way that his two sons came out and gave their short speech and ended with, oh yeah! And then the, the whole stage filled with smoke, filled with smoke and out comes the undertaker and you could feel the chills and the silence in the audience as Taker bends to one knee, holds the urn, raises it high, bows his head. I'm gonna tell you, I have never seen a more fitting tribute or an induction to any Hall of Famer in the WWE. Impeccable. And I, for one, I disagree with you. I disagree with you wholeheartedly. Taker is one induction. Fair. William Moody, Paul Bearer, Percival Pringle III, that's his own thing. The only thing I wish was Bill Moody was alive to 
have participated, but I will tell you this. The spirit of Bill Moody, Paul Barra, was present and alive. I felt it. I know everybody in that arena felt it at WrestleMania when they did the Hall of Fame induction. I tell you, Paul was there. Bill Moody was there. I know he was with us looking down, enjoying this, and smiling on everyone. So well done. Superbly done. Well, we try and keep his spirit alive here in the MWF. You know how much I think of him. Um, and the, like that induction gave me chills. I, thought it, I couldn't think of a better way for it to be done in that capacity. And I'm sure it meant so much to his kids. I really had wanted to go, but, you know, physical life uh, with this body takes precedent, unfortunately. But that's a different story for a different time. Also at the Hall of Fame, you had... Um, Jake the Snake Roberts, certainly an enigma in professional wrestling. Again, I'm not a, a big fan of his due to certain incidents here in the MWF, but you were there for his big night, Johnny. Well, first, we get to start out with a little saying. Let he is without sin, let him cast the first stone, Dan Marotti. I'll cast that stone. If you've never done I, it. I'll tell you this, and I take great pride in it. In the almost 13 years the Millennium Wrestling Federation has been in existence, there is not one human being that can honestly say they were stiffed on a payday. They weren't given what they were promised. We have a situation where someone one time was given money for something they didn't do at all. It didn't live up to their contract at all, but that was out of kudos to someone I respect an awful lot. So, I remember her. Mm. I remember her. Um, however, all I'm trying to say is that if... I'll cast that If stone. none of us have ever done anything wrong in our lives, then I say stand up. Jake Roberts, you have to remember when you were dealing with him, and I've dealt with him, I've been in shows with him, um, he's always treated me with respect. I respect Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake had some demons, had some devils. Um, sometimes those demons and devils get in your way. This may have been a situation. And in that case, you need to be understanding. Um, I can tell you this, that I saw at the Hall of Fame a different Jake Roberts. It was not the same Jake that I had worked with before, had done several, excuse me, several shows with. It was a humble, almost a man asking for forgiveness from his family, from his fans, and his friends. It was a new Jake Robbins. It was a person who truly, truly appreciated what was happening and truly made an open confession to everyone. Um, I'm glad to see you made it, Jake. You deserve it. And I like the new Jake Roberts. Well, I'll say, personal issues aside, Jake the Snake Roberts certainly belonged in WWE Hall of Fame and just about any Hall of Fame. I'm a tremendous uh, superstar back in the 80s into the 90s, tremendous moments in professional wrestling. Um, Jacqueline and I spoke about that on a recent edition of The Insiders. You know, it, it, it's great to see him as a human being be doing so well. DDP Yoga um, has been the magic touch for him and Scott Hall. Jake is much in great shape. I mean, he hasn't looked this good since, uh, you know, the early 90s. When he was back in 1996, as a part-time wrestler and a part-time agent, he doesn't look as good. He didn't look good as then as he does now. Um, what I did not like, though, and I thought was kind of disrespectful, he had the nice moment with his kid, I mean, his children. Um, him using that language with Vince McMahon's grandkids in the front row. I thought that was classless. Say, what did he say? Was it masturbating with their minds or something like that? If you, um, if you recall, and I'm sure you did, I didn't take offense to that because he thought about it before he said it, and then he said, oh, well, why not? It's entertainment, so this is really what professional wrestling is all about. And so he chose to use a word that perhaps is not colorful, perhaps is not acceptable, perhaps can be turned into any meaning that you want. But the word masturbation converts to the word self-pleasure. So professional wrestling is our, yours, where at studio you're in, is your self-pleasure. It allows us our escape. I took no offense at it because I listened to the word and interpreted it, not as a sexual innuendo, but as a, a word meaning self-pleasure, something that's pleasurable, something that's enjoyable. And certainly, WWE professional wrestling is definitely enjoyable, 
action packed and pleasurable. That you can't get away from. I give you 10 Jake Roberts. I take my hat off to you, Jake Roberts. You apologize to your family in public. You were brought to tears. I know you brought some people to tears in that arena because I was sitting next to those who were weeping. You are truly a different man. I only hope and pray that you stay the man you are because that's the man we need to see. Well, I didn't really think we'd get into a long discussion about the uh, dictionary definitions of masturbation on this show, but you know what? That's what makes professional wrestling so interesting. Uh, I don't think the crowd really understood what he was saying when he talked about how he at times abandoned his family and so on. He was trying to you know, speak from the heart, and they were applauding him. And he was telling them not to applaud. I don't know if you actually had a chance to see um, the online version of it from the WWE Network. I was there live. Right. And I can tell you this. He was telling them not to applaud because it's like, I have sinned. Right. Why are you applauding me for sinning? But they were applauding him out of respect because here he is openly confessing to 85,000 people, I cheated on my wife. I didn't give a damn about my kids. I was busy with drugs and having sex with women. That, my friend, takes a lot of chutzpah, as we say in Jewish. It takes a lot of balls to go out there and do what Jake the Snake did. And the applause was to say, wow, what a man to openly come out and confess openly to millions of people, as The Rock would say, millions and millions and millions of people about what he's done wrong, about the caution to young wrestlers not to make the same mistake that I've made, to people like you, Marathi, not to make the same mistake. Oh, I'd never that make I the made. mistakes he did. Well, you never know. Hey, what this can coming from in your a jerk. Life in the Studio A right now that made comments about the prescribed medications that I need to take and the prescribed narcotics I need to take for my back, my feet, my neck. I never made the mistakes Jake made, but you know what, everybody's different, and I, again, I applaud him for having the courage to come out and say something like that. You gotta tip it, your hat to him. If someone can learn from it, I think that's a good thing. You tip your hat to him, you tip your hat to Scott Hall, yo, were the words that came out of Scott Hall's mouth when he reached that podium he kept it short, he kept it sweet, and he kept it real. And that's what I liked about three. And they were all very good. But Jake Roberts, Scott Hall, Ultimate Warrior, kept it real. Not to say that the other ones didn't. Paul Bear, outstanding. I think some speeches went too long. Some speeches could have been a little longer. There was one that really went out to left field. Um, <laughs> I don't know where that was coming from. I think that one from. went out of the park. Yeah, I have no idea what was going on there. I, I couldn't even follow it. That's how bad it was. It had nothing to do with professional wrestling. It had nothing to do with the Hall of Fame. I would have thought at least I would have thanked those people um, who were involved with helping me get where I was. Hulk Hogan, Roddy Piper. Uh, nope, no mention of that. So Vince McMahon, nothing. Um, it was just he went on and on about, we're talking about Mr. T now. The man that headlined WrestleMania 1, he was in one of the feature matches at WrestleMania 2. Um, he went on for a good 20-some-odd minutes about how much he loved his mother. It was kind of awkward. Well, I, he kind of lost me when he said two urinary tracks. And, you yes, know, I forgot I, about that. I, I just, yep. just kind of sat back and I, I looked at some of the people around me and I go, I thought the world of this guy, and I still do, but this is not the time, this is not the place to preach. Because, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but he was talking about mom, and he was talking about God, and he was preaching from Scripture. Not the place to do it. Um, as a matter of fact, he ran out of time. He was interrupted. If you saw it online by Cain, uh, his time was up. Uh, I don't know. I, I was that just, nonsense cut away from other speeches, time-wise. Yeah. Well, that the, event live went almost four hours. I, I was there. I can tell you this, right. and I have nothing against the first inductee, but... Um, I think that her speech was a little lengthy, too. It was 45 minutes oh. is a long time. It was ridiculously long, but the difference between her and Mr. T, she was around for more than two matches, so she probably had a lot more to say. I thought it was great that Lita had mentioned a lot of the folks that she broke in with, some of the independent promotions. Not everybody does that. 
um, in a Hall of Fame capacity, so kudos to Lita for that. But he, like you said, it just went too long. The Mr. T thing was ridiculous. And to take away from someone like Paul Bearer's kids, what they might have wanted to say about their dad before Undertaker came out, Scott Hall was, well, he wasn't Scott Hall. This was the Razor Ramon persona from 92 to 96 that was inducted. But I'm sure the man had much more to say than he did. Never mind Carlos Colon. He was inducted by his sons um, and his MWF nephews. Undisputed Champion yeah. Carlito, along with the Matadors, his son and nephew. Um, I would have liked to have heard a little bit more what they had to say. I think that, well, I was there. And I can tell you this. I think that Carlito and his kids, um, uh, nephews, they were given the time they needed. I think Carlos Colon uh, did an, a very nice job at what he uh, had to say and the amount of time he had to say it. And I will say this, there's a gentleman, a man, who summed it all up and said it all. You know, when I used to write for the Salem News as a, as a reporter and a feature writer, I can remember the editor looking at one of my stories and he said to me, you know, kid, think about this, even the Bible could be written in one paragraph. So Carlito and his family and Carlos Colon did exactly that. They took what they had, he gave what he had to give, and said what he had to say in the amount of time he had to say it. But I will tell you this, like baseball, Carlos Colon covered all the bases. So kudos to you. I told Carlito he did a wonderful job, a little bit of humor in there. Um, everybody did a fantastic job. Uh, I, I, the only fault I found at the Hall of Fame, I've already said how I feel about at least two of the inductees. Um, outside of that, it is what it is. Well, and we'll talk about now the, the gentleman that was in the main event. Maybe uh, your life kind of paralleled his for a few days, as crazy as it sounds, but uh, the return of the Ultimate Warrior to WWE in official capacity had kicked off with his induction speech um, the night before WrestleMania at the Hall of Fame. He went on last. He gave a really a speech from the heart. I don't think uh, that was written beforehand where it was kind of all over the place. It was thought it was great that he came out with his kids like that. Um, and he mentioned his kids in it. And a lot of the times, you know, for whatever the reason may be, a lot of the guys really don't go out of their way to give the children props like that. And I think they certainly deserve it where they miss so much time with family. Jim Helwig, Warrior, I had a chance to work a couple of shows with him at autograph signings, um, one in Maine and one in Boston. You might not necessarily agree with everything the warrior said, but I will tell you this about Jim Helwig, warrior. He spoke from his heart, and he believed in what he said. He was a true, true individual, a real human being. At WrestleMania, uh, at um, the Hall of Fame, the love he showed for his wife and his children to me, being a father of five, said it all. He basically stated when he came out, he's glad they would let him have a towel because he would sweat a lot. His face was bright red. Yes, really um, red. He tipped over the bottle of water if you, if you, if you kind of look at it. But if you listen to his words at the Hall of Fame induction, and then you listen to his words at Raw, and I was there front row. And I will tell you, I was, his wife was two seats over with his beautiful two daughters. No truer words were spoken of any man that when his heart and lungs stop, you know, he'll be eulogized and remembered forever. He pulled on those ropes and couldn't breathe. And I mean that. The man gave his own eulogy. Now, whether you know what's going to happen or you don't know what's going to happen. The ultimate warrior is a legitimate hero. Not only in the wrestling ring, but to his wife, Dana, and to his two daughters. He's a hero to those out there who are afraid to face challenges, who are afraid to believe in themselves, who are afraid to go where no man dares to tread. Warrior did it all. And so I said it many times before, I'll take this opportunity to say it again. Ernest Hemingway wrote a book called For Whom the Bell Tolls. And today, Warrior, the bell tolls for you. God bless and rest in peace. 
All right, wrestling fans, I think right now would be a good time to take a brief commercial break. We'll check out what's happening in WWE on the WWE Network. We'll be back after this timeout. Boston. On Sunday, June 29th, all roads lead to WWE's Money in the Bank pay-per-view. Live in Boston for the first time ever. See John Cena, Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, Sheamus, The Shield, The Wyatt Family, and more. Compete to seize the briefcase with the Money in the Bank contract for the chance to become WWE World Heavyweight Champion. It's WWE Money in the Bank, live in Boston, Sunday, June 29th. Tickets available Saturday, April 12th. In 2014, the WWE superstars will all be fired. They'll exit the ring and enter Slam City, where they'll face their greatest challenge ever, finding day job. You want this job? You got to do three things. Now, WWE goes animated. We aim to please here. With all new stories. You're welcome. New looks. Thank you, Mr. Nightman. Who wants dessert? And new adventures. This car's attitude has been adjusted. But don't worry, it's still the same WWE attitude. The champ is here. See more at WWEslamcity.com. Check out the latest episodes of Slam City at Cartoonium on YouTube and on WWEslamcity.com. Now you will step into the cold, dark world of the Ultimate Warrior. For the first time ever, the Ultimate Warrior only gave as much respect to people as they were due. Hear the stories behind the matches. You know, I started my career with Sting. It's not like we really had any love for one another. A lot of people have made a career out of it. trying to delegitimize Ultimate Warrior's impact on the business. If I would have known, I never would have went back for all the money that they gave me. From the superstar behind the face paint. It's time to tell the right story. Ultimate Warrior. The Ultimate Collection. Welcome back. Things are heating up in WWE as it always does coming out of WrestleMania each year. A um, couple more things to talk about before we hit the road with Mr. Cena in Studio A. Uh, we touched about it a little bit earlier, but Undertaker and Brock Lesnar, one of the most shocking moments in wrestling history, the streak went from 21-0 to 21-1. You know what? Anytime, anywhere, any place, it could end. It ended at WrestleMania 30. And I will tell you, being there in the front row, those F5s were devastating. Brock Lesnar slammed The Undertaker into the mat, and the finish, that last one, you could hear the body bounce and you could hear the skull hit the mat. One, two, three. Referee was in shock. Everybody in the arena was in shock. Take a look at Paul Heyman. He was in shock. So, I, I, Lillian Garcia, just everybody. Justin Roberts was like, what? What just happened? But the streak has ended. Brock Lesnar is the man that did it. Paul Heyman's the man that brought him to it. I say keep your eye on Brock Lesnar because he will be the new or the next WWE champ. I don't know if you had a chance to check out the Wrestling Inside as I had a chance to do with Wrestling Historian the Jackal last week, but yeah, I had so many mixed emotions about the Undertaker and Lesnar match. Undertaker losing created such a buzz um, that you wouldn't have got if WrestleMania ended with Daniel Bryan being the champion, Undertaker won. You had, it was 
what's the cool term, water cooler talk. Everybody was talking about Undertaker's streak ending. I mean, even on ESPN or Splits Illustrated, one of the two, if not both, had some kind of a piece about it. So they got a lot of talk about it. But my question is, from that, what's the follow-up to it with Brock Lesnar, who's only around maybe 12 to 15 times a year and only wrestles a couple of matches per year? I think what you may see now is uh, more frequency of Brock Lesnar. I think now you're going to see Daniel Bryan involved in some significant challenges. As you know, the challenge now is Daniel Bryan against Kane. In extreme uh, rules. Kane yeah. destroyed him last night on Raw. Um, we'll see what happens, but I think you're going to see more of a presence of Lesnar, whether it's on videotape or whether it's live at the arena. Um, but I would think, and it's just me, I know nothing more than you. I would think that ultimately, if he broke the streak, he's the next person in line for that championship belt. I just can feel it in my bones. I don't think Brock Lesnar can lose right now because it would take away from the meaning of what he did at WrestleMania with Undertaker. That's why I would have loved to have seen, I'm really high on Roman Reigns. I see him not becoming another Undertaker, because there's obviously only one Undertaker, but someone that has a career of destruction like Undertaker, depending upon how he's presented. I would have loved to have seen someone like that. I think it would have been even more shocking if it was someone like that, and they could use that at, every, at their disposal at every television taping they have. With Lesnar, you have to kind of have Paul Heyman play with it. Not that that's a bad thing, but you don't have the impact of the man that actually did it. If Brock Lesnar came back to be a champion, and even if he worked just the pay-per-views once a month, I think that would be really interesting with the setup they have right now in WWE. I don't think you need the man. I think you just need to mention the man. I think you need to mention the man and the fact that look what he did. Look what we did. This, it's still fresh in the memory of the fans of what Brock Lesnar did and to whom he did it. Um, I just, who knows, maybe Lesnar's contract is coming to an end. Maybe they'll renegotiate a new contract where we'll get to see more of Brock. Um, who knows? Well, his current deal goes through, unless it's changed, through WrestleMania next year in um, San Jose. Well, then I would definitely think that you're going to see Brock Lesnar in WrestleMania 31 as the heavyweight champion of the world, and who he'll be fighting remains to be seen. And I have nothing against Daniel Bryan. One hell of a champion, one hell of an individual. Nobody deserved that belt more than he did. And I was so glad to see him win it. But as, as my friend Mr. Marathi said in the other studio, um, it was kind of overshadowed by the streak. How cool was it to see someone that competed right down the street from here for the MWF at Memorial Hall, Daniel Bryan. Right now, he is the man. I mean, John, your son, John Cena, perhaps he's the biggest star, especially with the amount of merchandise that he moves. But right now, Daniel Bryan is the man with not 15, but 30 pounds of gold because he has two belts. Um, it's an exciting time right now. You can just, the one thing I like about WWE right now is this, you can feel the change. You can feel the movement going on. Whether you're talking about Bryan as the champion, um, taking Batista and Orton, who were maybe a little bit stale at one point, and now they're kind of re-energized as evolution. The Shield is doing so much more now. The Wyatts are becoming a focal point of what's going on. He had someone like Cesaro. You talk about a WrestleMania moment. Scooping up Big Show in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal and throwing him over the top rope. They can use that footage for decades to come, depending, along, uh, de depending upon how long Cesaro is around for in WWE, but that was just an outstanding moment. You, I, it's just a lot of exciting things going on in WWE, even something as small as the Intercontinental Title Tournament. I don't know if you've watched Raw the past two weeks, but it just felt like, as opposed to a regular tournament, it just had a little bit more spice to it for some reason. It's just, I, I don't know, I, I'm just, I think WWE is in a good place right now. Well, I've heard it said before that it's time they start putting over some of the younger stars. Listen, if you can't see what's happening now, then you can't see me. Because the younger people, the up and coming stars are being put over, really over. Um, Daniel Bryan, Bray Wyatt, uh, Roman Reigns, uh, you look at Cesaro, I was there. Um, what can I say? Do I agree with everything that's been done? That's between me, myself, and I. 
Um, but I see what's happening. I have to agree. The change is good. There's a whole new wind blowing. It's becoming the old slash new WWE. The reformation of evolution, the new villains, the new um, heroes. I think there are bright things ahead for the wrestling fans of WWE here in the United States and throughout the world. I like what I see. How many of those guys really had a big factor in WrestleMania 29 just a year ago? You look at how interesting that changes over the course of a year. What's going to happen over the next year now from WrestleMania 30 to WrestleMania 31 as, things, as the deck reshuffles itself? I think it's really great between that, the WWE Network, if fans are watching it the week we're taping this, don't forget it's the last chance to get the free one-week trial for the network. Again, you will not regret spending $9.99 a month on that especially where you get all the free pay-per-views, as you saw in the commercial we had during the timeout. Um, I don't know, Johnny, uh, can you predict the main event at this point at WrestleMania 31, or is it just right now so much going on? Is WWE kind of just, like you said, the winds of change have come? Could you see a main event right now at WrestleMania 31? I suppose I could see Brock Lesnar versus The Rock for the heavyweight championship. Mm. Um, I suppose suppose that would be the biggest match right there. Um, what's going to come down the road for WrestleMania 31? That's kind of surprising because, you know, um, it's kind of like the tide coming in and going out. It cleans the sand. Then you're right in the sand and the tide comes in. So things are changing very quickly, very rapidly in WWE. And at a moment's notice, we all know this, Look at The Undertaker, 21 and 0, 21 and 1. That's how fast the tide came in and went out. So I don't know, but I would think the most likely challenge would be, and I'll tell you what I'd like to see, I'd like to see Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg for the WWE Heavyweight Championship. You're or, a Goldberg fan. Or a three, well, no, I just think that you've got to put, you got to put big men against big men. It makes sense. I understand that this is entertainment. But at some point, you have to create the illusion of believability. So you make it a four-way, a three-way. You put Lesnar, Goldberg, Triple H, Randy Orton. I don't care who you put in there, but put them in so that it makes sense. And then when the title changes hands, it makes sense. I really think it's going to be an exciting year. And I'm going to throw this one out at you, Johnny. I mentioned Roman Reigns as someone that I, going back, to early in his stint in WWE is a guy that could, not the Undertaker, but have a path like Undertaker did. He's just, he has the size, he has the uh, explosive nature about him. I could really see him being, at some point, uh, the guy in WWE. Well, you know what, I'm gonna tell you this. The fans of WWE are like the wind. Um, the fans of WWE have a tendency to change. Um, Right now, we have a huge yes chant. Quincy Rustani likes to do the yes chant. Well, let's see how long the yes chant stays. You know, again, and I'll say it, I've said it a thousand times and I won't back down. One of the most deserving individuals in the WWE, Daniel Bryan, got exactly what he deserved and that was the title. No more deserving person. Worked his way up. Put him over. And that's what they needed to do and they did it. My hat's off to him. A tremendous human being and a tremendous individual. But let's see how long it is before we got to get something new. So let's just see what happens. I don't like to predict the future. I don't like to go that far forward. I'm the kind of guy that takes one day at a time. One fabo buck at a time. One day at a time. I have today, and I'll worry about tomorrow if I get there. I've got a million wrestlers in my stable. Oh. Who the next champion will be, we'll see. I've made Marathi an offer. We'll see what happens on that. I've got people I like and people I don't like. So the WWE, will things change? Absolutely. Will Roman Reigns be the man? Will he be the face of the company? Not unless he cleans up a little bit. You can't have that look. Maybe it'll work. I don't know. But we'll see. That's all I can tell you is we'll see. Well, a lot happened in wrestling. I am amazed that this program has gone as smooth as it has, as you know, 
fans out there, I'm not a big John Cena senior fan, but the man has a lot of knowledge about this business, and I do respect that. And it's nice to have a genuine conversation about the king of sports professional wrestling in general. Um, maybe we'll have you back sometime soon, Johnny. I, I have enjoyed this to a degree, and I think the fans will too. Uh, I re we don't have time in this episode, but I wanted to touch upon the Nancy Grace disgrace oh. issues going on. And our friend R.J. Brewer, John Walters, is going to be a guest on Thursday. He called me and texted me on that. R.J. Brewer is going to be on the Nancy Grace show. Uh, Nancy Grace, you are a disgrace to even come out and imply or try to get people to imply that Warrior's death was due to steroids. That's just total disrespect for the individual, his family, and the whole world of professional wrestling. R.J. Brewer, if you can hear me, listen to me. Talk about wrestling and nothing else. Deal with what you have to deal with. Don't get led around like a donkey. And again, I think it was a total disgrace. It could be a big night for R.J. Brewer, but you know what, I have to touch upon this now because I just hate the woman. Back during the Benoit saga, I wrote a, I thought a very good column that a lot of people spoke highly of about her and how she uh, tried to turn that into her own benefit, how she claimed she was going to save professional wrestling when she had that other sleazebag, Billy Graham, on the two of them. Oh, we're going to save wrestling. We're going to help the boys. What has she done? Nancy Grace, I say this to you. I'm sure she's never going to see it. But fans, if you want to tweet her, Facebook or whatever, Nancy Grace, her parent company, had a lot to do with professional wrestling for a long time. Maybe she should talk to her parent company when Ted Turner had WCW in his hands and talk about what their drug policies were. Talk about what their drug testing schedule was. Talk about what their alcohol and rehab processes were. There's a lot that can be said about Turner Sports, how they operated WCW back in the day. That pisses me off more than anything because she's on as this little crusade as long as the ratings are good to try and knock WWE. And you know what? People may not like each other. People have issues with this and that. But at the end of the day, professional wrestling is a fraternity and it should be a brotherhood. And we need to look out for each other. And I.J. Brewer is a great man with the great intelligence. I look forward to him talking to Nancy Grace on Thursday. Hopefully the business will be presented in a better light. I think DDP was caught off guard with what she wanted to talk about. But what gets me was people say, oh, the Warriors autopsy came back. It didn't involve drugs and alcohol. You know what? The fact of the matter is a man that had heart issues like that at that age and took the amount of steroids that he admitted he took when, during the Vince McMahon trial in 1994. It's tragic. It's sad. People are going to talk about it. Did it need to be done less than 24 hours after the man passed away when he was in a morgue somewhere before his family had a chance to put him to rest? That's what pisses me off about the whole thing. She had no right to do that. At least treat the situation with a little bit of respect. There was no respect. To have Owen Hart on a list when you're trying to pump people to get drugs, drugs, alcohol, alcohol, steroids, steroids, deaths, deaths. Owen Hart's death was an accident that had nothing to do with a drug, a steroid, alcohol, none of it. Her list, did it specifically say it was a drug-related death? No. But the whole segment was to imply that every one of those people was somehow involved in a steroid death in WWE, and shame on that woman or whoever her staff is that put her little list together. Shame on them. I was waiting to see Tony Rumble's name come up, because then I really would have cut a promo on that. Tweet Nancy Grace, Facebook Nancy Grace, her program. I think she's on, is it CNN? Headline News? Email, text, CNN, whatever you want to do, but let your voices be heard. There are a lot of people that don't like professional wrestling. If you're a wrestling fan, you may have family members that just scoff at it. You may have friends that laugh at it. But if you get professional wrestling, if you enjoy it the way we do, this is a chance to speak out. Because what she did was spit on the face of people that had passed away, and it spits on a great industry that does a lot of great things for a lot of people and a lot of aspects of life. Is it a perfect industry? Absolutely not. Was there a time period where the fraternity dived into the pool of steroids and drugs and alcohol? Absolutely. But you know what? It's a different day. I want to know what kind of a policy Ted Turner and the parent company of Nancy Grace's show, what they do for the boys. Do they send out a letter every year saying, if you've ever been under contract, we'll get you the help you might need if you have a problem? Absolutely not. WCW's policies were a disgrace. You see a lot more guys from the WCW days 
on the little list that Nancy Grace put together. I could go on for an hour about that, but I just hope R.J. Brewer hits not a home run, but a grand slam for the boys, Johnny. Me too, because it is a brotherhood, and you know what? I would type Nancy Grace disgrace, and, and I'm going to tell you something, Nancy Grace. Before you start throwing rocks, why don't you look in the mirror? And then, when the person in the mirror is perfect, then I turn around and start throwing rocks at other people. You've disgraced yourself. You've disgraced the business. You've hurt a family, and you've two hurt a legend. Two families. Yep. Two families. Yep, two families. I'll go along with that. And you know what? I just think, as, as Dan said, he and I don't agree very often, but not even 24 hours after the man had passed, you decided it was time to dig up the body and shake it. Well, you know what? Classless, tactless, stupid, idiotic, completely tasteless. Is it headline news or is it the National Enquirer? Because the way she presented it, Inquirer. that's what it was. It's not a news program if you're a Nancy Grace fan. No. It's an infotainment type program it's is a, what it's the a word national is it now. Inquirer. You're Screw right, her. Yep. She wishes she could get the numbers that WWE gets every Monday night, that they get on Friday night. Because you know what? People are onto the con job and they realize that her news is mostly a bunch of exaggerated BS. Well, let's see what R.J. Brewer does. I've managed R.J. Brewer. He and I have been in a ton of matches. Um, I have the utmost confidence in R.J. Brewer. Um, the only thing you don't want to do is get conned or caught off guard like DDP was. That was totally unexpected. Believe me, and I will tell you this, I saw DDP down at the Hall of Fame, and he was very upfront. If he knew that was going to happen, he would never, ever have accepted to appear on the show. So, RJ, keep your ear to the ground. Cover the boys. Take care of the business. Remember, we're all in this together. We can talk more about that in the near future. Again, a couple of little plugs. We have our online campaign here in the Millennium Wrestling Federation. There's a link that's gone up that'll take you right to the Indiegogo page. We have Axe and Smash Demolition, two legends coming to this studio on Sunday, June the 22nd. Um, platinum and VIP tickets are available now. You can get an autograph, a posed photo here in the studio, um, even take part in the studio shoot interview they're going to do. With the campaign we have going on right now, we have the possibilities to have not one or two, not three, not four, not five, but up to six wrestling greats here in this very studio to document their career. And I feel that's very important. Um, we started this campaign, sadly, right, almost hours within the time of the Warriors passing. WWE does a great job at putting history packages together, their DVDs. But there's so many stories from the guys that don't get told. That's what we're trying to do here so fans can learn and be educated about this great sport for decades to come in a non-WWE capacity. WWE has their network, which is outstanding. Again, check out WWE Network for free this week, and then you only pay a $9.99 a month and get the pay-per-views too. Deal isn't even the right word. Um, but we also have, as we mentioned, Demolition. We had Vader with us back on March 30th. Johnny, you ran from him. Um, Carlito and Al Snow were with us in January. You especially ran from Carlito after he threatened to cut you back in September and you had him suspended. That's a different story for a different time. But what about our good friend, mutual friend up at Kowloon on Route 1 North in Saugus, Johnny? On Friday, June the 27th, Saturday, June the 28th, the hardcore legend Mick Foley brings his comedy show to Kowloon. Well, you know what? The Cenas think the Kowloon is the best place on earth for Chinese food or sushi, whatever you choose to have there. As you remember, it was John when I was in there doing This Is Your Life, John, that said, Dad, let's take it easy. See you later at the Kowloon, one of the best places on earth for good food and good entertainment. And yes, Mick Foley is going to be there, Dan Marotti, June 27th and June 28th. I don't know about you. I've got my tickets. I'm going to be there both nights, hopefully. Um, I just can't wait to see Mick Foley's show. I've talked to those people that have seen it. They say it's great. So to the Wong family, my friend Andy and Bobby, um, and all my good friends up there, um, be there for Mick Foley's comedy night, June 27th and 28th. It's going to be hilarious. I was up at Kowloon last night late with the, one of the MWF superstars. Had a great talk with Andy Wong. He's pumped about Mick Foley coming to Kowloon. That's coming off of the holiday headlocks, Christmas dinner we had back in November. Um, so much great things going on in the world of professional wrestling. We had so much to talk about with the Hall of Fame and WrestleMania. 
still more we could have chatted about, but we only have a limited amount of time with uh, <coughs> his schedule. But Johnny, I do have to say it was interesting to have you here in studio. Well, if nothing else, Dan, it's been an enjoyable experience. I hate to use that word because you and I are always at each other's no, throats. No, I hate you. Make it but, clear. Well, I hate you well, with you know a great what? passion. I have no and I wish vile, angry, disturbing things to happen to you. I, uh, that's because you're a sick man. And ultimately, someday, somewhere, they'll take care of the sick man with a jacket sick man. that has no sleeves, that tied behind your back, and will get you in that room with the padded cell. But until that point, you need to tolerate me, and I need to tolerate you, because the both of us, regardless of how you feel about me, are working towards the same end. And that end is the best in professional wrestling. And someday, somehow, you're going to see that, and you might just stop working for me. But anyway, hate me, like me, boo me, cheer me. I'm still the best there is. I am nothing short of fabulous. Thank you. All right, wrestling fans, you heard it from the horse's mouth, or his ass, however you want to look at it. We're going to be back soon with more great entertaining programming, taking a look at the great world of professional wrestling. Not only WWE, there's a lot going on in the world of TNA. Jeff Jarrett's new GWF promotion that has aligned itself with AAA in Mexico. That's really an interesting thing to talk about. That's what's so great about wrestling. Whether you love it, whether you hate individuals, it captivates you. And a uh, respectful opinion isn't a bad thing at all. For John Cena Sr., wrestling historian The Jackal, who's off with some of his women at the Bunny Ranch in Nevada, we'll see you next time. Be well.